Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is James. I work here at the Education Department in the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. I'm watching all the fun things the sharks are doing behind me, trying to figure out what that is. Now, we're going to be talking about adaptations today. But it's not just me talking at you. You get to participate, too. So you can text us or email us. If you're watching live, text us at 562-286-1838. Your questions, things you want to learn more about, ideas that you might have about adaptations, or you can email us if you're not watching live Monday morning at live at lbaop.org. So what are adaptations? Let's see if we can define an adaptation. Have you heard that word before? Maybe we've heard the word adapt or adapting. Well, that's an action word. When something adapts to something, they are doing the process of adaptation. So what is an adaptation the thing? Didn't realize you're getting an English lesson today, too. Neither was I. Anyways, the adaptations of all the living things, anything, plant, animal, algae, mushroom, any living organism, adaptations are how they survive. Things on or in their body, abilities or learned behaviors that help a living thing survive in their habitat. So let's think about what those examples might be. What are adaptations of sharks? That's a pretty good animal to start with. So let's take a few seconds watching Shark Lagoon. Think about what adaptations sharks have. So what did you come up with? What is a thing that a shark has that helps it survive? Is it top hats and walking sticks? No. I would love to see a shark in a top hat, though. That seems amazing. What about fins and tails? Do those help sharks survive? Yeah, good job. What does a shark tail do? Is it moving up and down? Or around in a windmill? No. They're doing this motion, back and forth, side to side. So their bodies have a special shape and design to swim with a tail that is vertical. Other animals swim differently. How does a different animal swim? Let's think of something that's not a shark or a fish that swims. Were you thinking whale? I was actually thinking polar bear, but also a marine mammal. But mammals, just even the few types of marine mammals there are, they swim differently. A whale moves its big tail up and down like this. Their tail is horizontal, or the fluke is called, it's horizontal. A shark tail is vertical. Do, do polar bears have tails to push with? Are they wiggling as they go through the water? No, not really. Polar bears actually swim very differently. They do rely on the ocean for their food, other resources that they need. They do go out on land to have their babies, but when they're swimming through the water, are they doing this like we swim sometimes? They actually swim more like I do. <laughs> they do it this way, like they're constantly holding a ball. So the way that they swim is specific to their arms, their paws, so that they can swim effectively to get their food. So just because it swims doesn't mean it all they all swim the same way. And de depending on the type of body they have, that changes the adaptation of how they swim. What about other things with arms? How do they swim? Let's take a look at maybe a sea otter. Let's see if Allie can find me a picture of a sea otter. And let's look at what they do while they're in the water. They have such cute little arms and paws. 
They also have these kind of flipper-like back feet. Do you think an otter would be swimming like this? Almost like a doggy paddle? Or moving their tail up and down or side to side? Well, while you're thinking about how a sea otter swims, let's answer one of the questions that came in. How, how do animals evolve? Do non-living things have to adapt? Great questions. Now, an animal like a sea otter, over time, it adapted to something. So evolution is how things change over time. You can define, as the scientist, what timeline you're talking about. It can be a century. It can be a hundred million years. It can be a billion years. It really depends on what you're defining as the timeline that you're monitoring the change over. Now, if we look at the fossil record, there's lots of fun things in the fossil record that don't exist anymore, like true dinosaurs. We still have birds, but they're not quite the same as a T-Rex. That's not quite the same as a T-Rex. So the way things change over time is because of the environment. So when you're asking how do things evolve or change, it's because of the environment. Well, let's go back to a tropical reef habitat like Shark Lagoon, and let's think about what the changes in the environment would do to the animals. So if you've been looking at what's going on in the scientific and natural world, you might have heard the term climate change. Now, the climate does naturally change, but the speed at which it's changing is not natural. That's human caused. And the problem is that adaptation is not always quick. So for our sharks that live in a habitat like this, if suddenly within 10 to 20 years, these coral reefs were no longer available, that would change things, wouldn't it? What do the coral reefs do? So that's a good place to think about the activities of these animals and how they rely on something. Coral provides structure for them to have babies, for their food to actually be there. The sharks rely on the coral to be the nursery for their food. And then it also actually makes oxygen. There's an algae inside the coral that makes oxygen for us. So if there's not enough coral, there's probably not enough of the other things too, which means all the different levels of the food web don't have enough food to survive unless they've adapted some way to survive the changing conditions. So as temperatures might change, if the coral can survive the temperature increase, that's great. They can survive. The other things might slowly adapt over time too. But if they can't, well, that changes the environment. Well, think of the whole changing process the planet has might have gone over over a long period of time. We're seeing a very short-term version of that. So that's the, the downsides of climate change. But don't worry. These animals do have some ability to adapt. And if we make positive choices every day, we can positively affect the environment. But I hope that helps answer how do animals evolve or change over time. It's the conditions of the environment. So we used a short timeline example to talk about how that might work. But you can also imagine the sharks that have been alive since both, well, not that individual, but sharks have been around since before dinosaurs. The world has changed quite a bit since the time of the dinosaurs. But the animals have adapted over that timeline. As the conditions of the planet changed around, they had the ability to still grow up, have babies, and their babies would then have those adaptations, those abilities that the parents had. And as long as it's a good adaptation, they can survive bad adaptations do happen. What if you were a shark whose tail was doing a windmill? Would it be the same way to swim and move around? If your tail was doing one of these and you were a shark, you could probably get around, but maybe it won't be as effective. You couldn't swim as much as your shark friends. You may not be able to find as much food as your shark friends. So you may not be able to have as many babies over your lifetime. So that's how it works. It's a slower process than we think, but there are some quick changes that happen in nature too. Different class for that. Now let's think about how things have adapted to live in other environments. So this is a coral reef habitat where we find sharks and tropical fish, stingrays. But what about our local ocean habitat here to Southern California? What about a kelp forest? 
if we're talking about how things survive, what are the conditions they have to survive in? Now, I notice in this space, there's a lot more particles and things in the water. It's not as clear. Hmm. That is a big difference between coral reefs and kelp forests. Coral reefs in general have very clear water. The light is needed to get to the coral so that algae that lives inside of them, that's also a good adaptation to have a seaweed roommate. They can survive in the bright, clear, warm waters. But here in Southern California, it's cold and murky and not the same, is it? Now, these sea lions, they seem very happy with a kelp forest habitat. They don't have any problems being here. But what adaptation does that sea lion have that allows them to live in the cold, murky habitat of Southern California? Hmm. Do they wear snowsuits? Like a, or scuba suits. Ali said scuba suits. They don't really have a wetsuit, do they? Their body is the wetsuit. That's an adaptation. They have a blubber layer inside their body. It's like wearing a jacket inside. You never have to worry about putting a jacket on because you've always got it. But then you have to worry about not being able to take the jacket off. That's where the sea otter comes into play a little bit. But seals, sea lions, whales, and some other marine species like penguins have blubber. Now, penguins have a very little bit. Other animals have a lot. Now, Parker is at kind of his heaviest of the summer. He does get heavier before the summer starts, and he loses weight throughout the summer. That's a natural thing for him to do. He's got a lot of extra blubber. He's got extra rolls. He's so cute, though. But that's a normal thing for marine mammals, is to have blubber to help keep them warm in a colder habitat. They can survive in some warmer habitats. There are sea lions that live in warmer climates. But they probably aren't going to be as frequent in very hot climates because they have a blubber layer, which may make them too warm too often. So in some cases, animals migrate and move around as the year changes to follow their food resources, but also where they're going to have babies. So some animals are pretty big. That is an elephant seal. The elephant seal can get, I think, 3,000 pounds or more. That's a lot of inside jacket they're wearing. That's just how their bodies are designed. But they can migrate great distances to follow their food resources. So they might move into colder water during the greatest part of their feeding season, and they need that blubber layer to get to that colder water in order to find food. Think of things that dive really deep. Now, elephant seals can dive very deep. They uh, think they could dive for up to an hour, it was. That's a long time underwater. I can't hold my breath more than half a minute, so I cannot win a holding breath contest. Maybe a staring contest from a great distance because they're big. I don't want to be standing next to them. They can hold their breath a long time to find their food. They can dive pretty deep into the cold water to find their food. So they need that fat layer. Even if it's out, outside here on the beach, it's pretty warm. They need that blubber layer to spend all that time underwater finding their food. Now, whales are kind of like that, too. Whales are marine mammals. They don't get on the beach to have babies, but they do need a lot of blubber to stay warm as they go down in the water to find their food. Humpbacks might eat anywhere from two to 3,000 pounds of food a day easily. They are diving anywhere from 100 to maybe 500 feet in the water at most to get to their food. Well, the water gets pretty cold pretty quickly, especially here in California where we have colder water. You might get down to the mid 40s without having to dive very deep into the water. So that is something that they have to be concerned with is having enough blubber during the feeding season that they can dive into the colder waters to find their food. Because the cold water, like we have here in California, tends to have more food floating around, more krill and more fish for them to eat. So they go down to warmer areas during the, during the winter, not because they like to take vacations in the winter, but because they're probably getting away from predators that might look for their babies. That's a natural part of the food web. It, you would want to hunt something that is easier to catch. So especially with the gray whales, that's not a gray whale, but especially with gray whales, scientists are looking at 
that they're not really going to warm waters to get away from the cold for having babies, but probably to go to the warmer areas where their predators tend to not hang out. So that's a learned behavior. You don't have to have a baby in Mexico like a gray whale if there's other adaptations. So dolphins can have babies wherever. Not all dolphins really migrate. Actually, a lot of dolphins don't migrate. They can have their babies anywhere because their pod family unit they live in can help protect the baby. That's a different adaptation, living in groups. Now, somebody asked a question a few minutes ago, how long do otters live? Since we're kind of talking about marine mammals, one of my favorite topics, well, let's talk about the otter too. Om, nom, 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 nom. Otters, I love otters. They can live about 20 plus years under human care. Now we have been able to uh, take care of they're no longer alive, but we were able to take care of two of the oldest otters that were alive under human care. So with constant medical attention, people feeding them the best food every day, every day spa day for an otter, basically, they can live quite a bit longer than out in the ocean. They might live eight to 12 years in the ocean, maybe 15 if they're really lucky, but they tend to not live as long because nobody's brushing their teeth. Nobody's giving them restaurant quality food every day or checking up on them at least two or three, four times a day. So if we had somebody checking in on us, making sure we were eating all the right things all the time, we probably live a pretty good life too. Well, sea otters, that's their daily life. Here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we make sure they are eating the best foods, have the best habitat space to live in, clean spaces, and if there's a medical problem, we have a vet office on site that we can take care of it right here. Oh, somebody decided to zoom out and it froze. <laughs> oh, well, we'll go back to the picture of the otter. So sea otters can live quite a while naturally, 8 to 12 years. That's a pretty good amount of time for a lot of animals in the ocean. They can live a lot longer with us. Now, some other animals might have incredible lifespans. One of the oldest living animals in the ocean is a shark. Have you heard of this shark? We don't have a picture of it, so don't worry. I do recommend you look it up with the assistance of an adult because they look kind of different for a shark. Lifespan is something that's kind of important. Maybe lifespan helps you survive because of the conditions that you live in. So remember, what the habitat looks like or is like, the conditions that are there, you, the living thing, have to be able to survive that. If you can't survive that, hopefully you adapt or a develop these abilities to survive over time. Now, in some cases, we can create our abilities to survive. But before we go into the next topic, the Greenland shark is one of the longest living sharks. It can live up to 400 years. That is impressive. I don't know anybody that's 400 years old. What? Do all things live that long? No, probably not. There are some things that live a very long time, but Lifespan is something that's kind of tied to their abilities to survive. Some of the shortest living animals in the ocean are octopus and relatives. They may only live one to four years. That's part of their adaptation. They are not living a long time because it takes a little bit of energy to grow up, but they also are producing a lot of offspring. Since they grow very quickly, they produce a lot of offspring that kind of counterbalances the lifespan effect. So other things that might wait a hundred years like the Greenland shark before they are able to have babies, they might only have babies so many times in their life. They have to wait until they are able to and have to grow up to a point where they can. Other animals might be able to reproduce constantly. Not the octopus, they only reproduce one time. But some things reproduce constantly. Can you think of something that has babies? I'm going to use the air quotes because they're not technically a baby. That has babies all the time? Hmm. What could have babies all the time? I thought of something fun. Jellies. Very different from everything else we've been looking at except coral. Jellies are a cousin to corals. Jellies can reproduce many times. Maybe not in this way, but in their other 
phase of their life, they can reproduce a lot. Now, the cool thing about this picture is there are jelly babies in this picture. Look at this little tiny star looking dot right there. I'm trying to map it on my little screen where I can see myself right there. The jelly babies that all came off of one individual, right? That might be all of them right there. They're all clones of each other. That's called asexual reproduction, where you're able to reproduce on your own and you just kind of make a new version that's the exact same copy as you. So jellies can reproduce in both ways. In this part, the way that you see here in our webcam, there's male and female. They can release sperm and egg, creates an embryo, land somewhere, and that embryo will grow into a very tiny little adult and it'll clone itself for, in some cases, years of time. And depending on what kind of population of jellies we might have in our jelly culture area where we grow new jellies, we could have tons and tons of clones of one jelly. Because of their environment, where they live, and how they need to survive, lots of things have developed very different adaptations. Well, let's think about how we compare to all of these things. Because I mentioned, sometimes you can create your own adaptations on your own. Hello, Jelly. Get out of the way of you. Without having to grow tentacles or blubber, we could figure out a way that we can actually choose to adapt because we have the ability to think about the problem and solve it outside of our bodies. So, like, I'm wearing a jacket. So I can survive in colder temperatures than I might normally survive because we can dress for the occasion. Or we can do things to protect our bodies so that it's easier to do certain things. We can wear gloves to protect our hands from dangerous surfaces. Cold water. You might have to wear special equipment to work with jellies because they do sting. All jellies sting. So we can create a solution to help us. Now, jackets are not in and of themselves an adaptation, but the ability to invent, that is probably human's greatest adaptation, is the ability to invent stuff. All right, now I'm going to let Allie pick the next thing to look at, and let's see if we can together figure out some adaptations. Now, Allie hasn't told me what she's going to pick. So we're going to, ex oh my goodness. One of the frowniest of the frowny footballs in the ocean. This is a frogfish. Well, let's talk about what the frogfish does. And let's see if we can figure out how it survives. Because they're a very different looking fish. But they're very cool. Does this have fins like the other fish we saw earlier? No, and frogfish tend to sit still on the seafloor or a rock somewhere almost all the time. They're just looking crabby, not happy at anything. But they, they don't have face muscles to smile, so it's not like they can. Their mouth shape is going to be something I'll talk about in a second. But they hang out in one spot for a long period of the day and wait. What are they waiting for? It's not like frogfish are like, man, I am so late for that appointment. I'm wondering if I'm going to move around today. They no longer have the ability to swim well. In some cases, they don't swim at all. These big kind of paddle foot-like fins end up working more like feet than to help them swim. So just because it has this little tail on the back doesn't mean it really swims anymore. They've adapted the ability to sit still and let their food come to them. I honestly kind of like that adaptation. But we got to move around so we stay active and we don't get too much of an inside jacket on our bodies. Um, anyways, the frogfish sometimes have this other special thing called a lure. The lure helps attract food to their face. So maybe their food's not so plentiful all over the place that they can just wait and shove their food in their mouth. Well, they don't have fans. Hand, they, they just vacuum the food in. They don't have to shove it in with their flippers, which or their fins. But they can attract food with this little lure. And depending on the kind of fish, there's other fish that have lures too. 
and it kind of dances around. It looks like it could be something that somebody else wants to eat, but they can't recognize that this bright orange thing is a fish. They get too close to the frogfish, and it will just swallow them whole. It's called an ambush predator. They ambush the things that gets too close to their face. They can swallow it and eat it. That's an interesting adaptation. Now, I'm not sure how that each, each kind of worked out where it's not able to swim as well and it was an ambush predator. Like, do they happen at the same time? Did one happen first? That's an interesting discussion you might have to have later. Because there's lots of ambush predators in the ocean that do swim, but this one does, no longer does. So maybe it could ambush its prey, but it no longer needed to really swim too much. So perchance it adapted away from swimming. Maybe it started out as a bad swimmer and it needed to ambush its prey. So it adapted, changed over time, many generations to be able to ambush its prey. Either one could have happened. We don't quite know. That's one thing I would love about time travel is to go learn everything that happened, why things do what they do. That's just me though. Um, anyways, frogfish have some pretty cool adaptations. That mouth is designed to capture food that's typically above or just in front of them. So that other picture of the frogfish, we can kind of see that. When you look at a fish mouth, you can kind of tell what they're going to eat, at least in the area around them, based off of the shape. Fish that have a mouth that points up have to grab their food from above them. Fish that have a mouth that point forward have to chase and grab their food. Fish that have a mouth that points down have to get on top of their food and eat it. So things like a zebra shark or a stingray are fish that have to eat things below them. Their mouth kind of points down. Do you see the big scary jaws of a zebra shark? Me neither, because it's not. Their mouth is really tiny, like right under here. So it's kind of forward, but kind of down. So they could chase and grab their food, but it's mostly beneath them. So that's an interesting adaptation. Your mouth direction kind of tells you more about what you might try to eat. Ooh, here's the mouth. Ooh, scary jaws. No, they're super cute. The zebra shark has this tiny little jaw for being a shark that's like seven to 10 feet long. Their, their jaw is like this wide. Not very scary, but it's designed to crush their prey. So they have little tiny teeth that they can grab their food, crunch some of the shells because maybe they eat like crustaceans, things with shells, little creepy crawly animals or snails or clams or something in the sand. And they need the teeth that can kind of crack and break the shell and then swallow it. They also have kind of sharp enough teeth to grab something that doesn't have a shell and still eat it. So there's lots of cool adaptations. When we look at animals in the ocean or on land or in the air, we can start to think about what are the abilities that that animal has to survive? Then take that a process, that ability of thinking about adaptations and think about the other living things. So the fish might take our attention most of the time because they're pretty cool. This fish likes to dance in the water and play in the bubbles. But this seaweed has pretty cool adaptations too. This type of algae can grow two to three feet per day under the best conditions, the most nutrients it could ever need, the best amount of sunlight it could ever need. It could grow that much, taller than I can put my hands on the screen, per day. Could you imagine growing two feet per day? It might make clothes shopping easier when you're a kid versus having to get clothes all the time. You're just like, you have baby clothes and then you have adult clothes, cool. But we, our bodies aren't set up adapted to survive an environment like that. Their bodies need to survive an environment like that. Whoosh, all that water, we're recreating the wave motions. So something that has to survive wave action might have a very slow growth rate or very fast one, depends on the kind of seaweed. So there's a lot of things that thing, other living organisms, living creatures or plants and algae can do to survive in a habitat. Now, as you continue to explore, I say, go look at our webcams. We have plenty of them on our website. You can check them out and start to think about adaptations. You can even explore around you. How does this spider in the kitchen survive? All the living things have adaptations to survive. Now, as you go explore, I also ask our teachers that are out there watching with your students, can you text us 
the number of students you have watching with you. We ask that because we do like to make sure that we're serving the community well and we know how many people are watching. We can help monitor our, our community that we're making programs for. So teachers, if you're out there, text us the number of students watching with you. If you're watching on your own, having fun, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back on Wednesday for more Aquarium Online Academy.